The Whistler. Sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I'm the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Whistler's strange story, Charming Hostess. Peter Courtney III belonged to one of San Francisco's first families. He was rich and popular and had a beautiful wife. But few of his friends had ever met Mrs. Courtney. She seldom left the Courtney's Atherton estate. Yes, the big rambling house and the beautiful grounds appealed to Barbara Courtney. She felt happy there and safe. It was only an hour's drive into the city. But to Barbara, it was like another world. And nothing intruded except the newspapers and the mail. The morning mail and newspapers placed at the breakfast table by the old butler, Williams, always gives you an uneasy feeling, doesn't it, Barbara? Yes, even though they usually turn out to be advertisements and invitations, even this morning. Anything interesting in your mail, darling? Oh, it's the usual, Peter, invitations. They still keep coming in spite of the fact that we never accept. I've been thinking about that, Barbara. You want to go out more. Oh, don't be ridiculous. I despise social affairs. Yes, I know. But I've been talking to Dr. Kastner. Dr. Kastner, the psychiatrist. Not about me. <laughs> no, dear, of course not. The subject came up accidentally. I see. We happened to have lunch together at the club yesterday, and he got to talking about seclusiveness. Seclusiveness? Staying at home too much. Dr. Kastner says it can become rather harmful. Oh, nonsense, dear. Lots of people don't like dashing around. Nevertheless, I've made up my Peter... mind. Peter, when we were married, you promised that we'd live quietly. And we have for quite a long time. Does it seem so long, Peter? No, darling, I didn't mean it that way. It seems only yesterday that I was in that military hospital overseas being cared for by a very lovely nurse. That's what I am, dear, a nurse. Not a socialite, just a plain, simple person. And a sweet one. Too sweet to be hidden away. But I like being hidden. I'm really very shy. (laughs) Yes, I know. I'll never forget that look on your face when they turned those newsreel cameras on us when we came back from Europe. I'll admit I was frightened. I realized for the first time that I'd married a very prominent man. That reminds me, our marriage anniversary is on the 10th. And do you know what we're going to do? I know, Peter, what? We're going to give a party. A big one. Oh, Peter, no. We'll invite everybody, all my old friends. But, Peter, it's out of the question. I, I, I just couldn't do it. I know nothing about entertaining. You'll learn. And you'll like it when you get used to it. But can't you see? I'm, I'm just not the type. I'll take a chance on you, Barbara. You're a lovely, gracious woman. You'll be a charming hostess. You stare at Peter in horror, don't you, Barbara? Because you can see that his mind is made up. And a big party, strangers, publicity, is the thing you want least in the world, isn't it? In the days that follow, you use every argument to make Peter give up the idea. But he goes right ahead with the invitations and plans. Then one evening, a few days before your anniversary, when he comes home from his office in the city, he presents you with something. It's your anniversary present. To wear at the party. A pearl necklace? Oh, Peter. I know that pearls are for the 30th anniversary, but I didn't want to wait 25 more years. You're so generous. I have so much jewelry, and now this? What can I ever give you in return? The only thing I want is many more years as happy as the last ones have been. Thank you, dear. You're very sweet. Oh, by the way, here's the evening paper. They've given us quite a write-up on the society page. Oh, Peter, do we have to have that sort of publicity? Of course. I wish they could have run your picture. But I have no pictures. I know. You must have some made, dear. Why, yes, I... I suppose so. Yes, I will. Sometime. It's in the second section. Oh. What's the matter? Oh, it it, it sort of startled me to see my name in print. Oh. 
For a moment, I thought something was wrong. No, no. There's nothing wrong. But there is something wrong, isn't there, Barbara? Yes. Very wrong. You've seen something in the paper. Something you don't like at all. And the minute you're alone, you read the item over and over again. Myra Dorsey has been released from prison. Myra Dorsey, the nightclub photographer. She hates you, doesn't she? Always has. And she'd do anything to find you, expose you. Because she didn't have your luck. Myra was arrested as an accessory in the Tremonti killing. While you got away, you, Babe Deems, the dark-haired checkroom girl, the one person that the police really wanted. Only they didn't look in the big Canadian hospital, where a shy and by then blonde student nurse was in training. The same nurse who later married Peter Cortland. Yes, Barbara. You know you must be more careful than ever now. And at the coming party, you must make sure there are no pictures. That subject comes up again the day before the party. When the butler, William, speaks to you. The San Francisco Society reporter's on the telephone, ma'am. She wishes your picture. Well, I'll talk to her myself, William. Uh, I- I'll take it on this phone. Very well, well. Excuse me. Hello, this is Mrs. Courtney. I'm doing a story on your party, Mrs. Courtney. I'd like to run your picture. I'm sorry, I haven't a recent photograph. Well, then perhaps you have an old one. When you were a brunette. A brunette? <laughs> I scared you, didn't I? This is no reporter, babe. It's your old friend, Myra Dorsey. You've made a mistake. Oh, no, you're the one who made the mistake. When you let me take the prison rap you had coming. And you made another one when you got in that newsreel. Newsreel? Sure, after your honeymoon. Oh, we see him in prison. Captain Peter Courtney returns from Europe with Bride. Only the Bride was Babe Deems with her dark hair bleached blonde. Ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Nobody recognized you but me. But, of course, I knew how you'd look as a blonde because I had the picture. Picture? What picture? A flashlight I took of you and Tremonti the night Tremonti was killed. You wore a blonde wig, babe. I still have the picture. Oh, and, of course, I have other things. Letters, things like that. Enough evidence that I could have Mrs. Peter Courtney picked up by the police within 24 hours. I see. How... How much do you want? Well, now you're talking like the old babe, Dean. You're going to pay me for every day I spent in prison. Fifteen thousand dollars. I'll be at your house at five o'clock tomorrow night to get it. No. No, don't come here. Well, why not? I've been wanting to see the court in your state for a long time. All right. But please, Myra, come to the side door. It's down the driveway. I'll let you in myself. The side door? Well, okay. For 15 grand, I can afford to be insulted. I'll be there at five on the dot. I'll watch for you from an upstairs window. What will you be wearing? Honey, they don't give you mink when you get out of prison. I'll be wearing the only thing I've got. A dark blue coat and hat. Even while you've been talking, you've decided on your first step, haven't you, Barbara? Yes. And that first step is to raise the money Myra demands by selling some of your jewelry. The next morning, after Peter leaves for the city, you take your own car and drive into San Francisco. But it takes much longer than you thought to raise $15,000, doesn't it, Barbara? And it's dangerously late by the time you start home. And you've got to keep the rendezvous at five with Myra. The traffic is heavy. And even driving fast, it's half past five when you arrive home. Then you see Peter's car. Realize that he's home. That will make things even more complicated, won't it, Barbara? You force yourself to enter the house. You find Williams very excited as he meets you at the door. Oh, Mrs. Courtney, I'm glad you're here. Mr. Courtney's been asking for you. Where is he, Williams? Upstairs with Dr. Adams. Dr. Adams? Peter isn't ill. Oh, no, ma'am. They're with the woman. Uh, woman? What woman? Uh, the poor woman was hit by a car right in front of the house. A woman was hit by a car? Who is she? Do you know? No, madam. I never saw her before. But I don't think she's a friend of the family. Well, what makes you think that? Well, for one thing, she's rather poorly dressed. Oh? Uh, what is she wearing? 
Very drab clothing, ma'am. Very. Uh, dark blue coat and hat. Barbara, you've been in a state of panic for several weeks, haven't you? Ever since your husband, Peter Courtney, insisted on giving an anniversary party. Then you learned that Myra Dorsey, out of prison, planned to expose you, reveal your grim past in connection with the Tremonti killing, unless you pay her $15,000. And you're sure this is just the beginning of a long series of blackmail demands. But now, returning home to keep your appointment with Myra, you learn of the hit-and-run accident in front of the house. You stand terrified, but strangely excited and pleased inside as you guess what happened even as Williams describes it to you. Mr. Courtney and I saw the whole thing as I was bringing him from the station. Fortunately, Dr. Adams happened along a few minutes later. We, we, we brought her in and, and put her upstairs in the green bedroom. Oh, Mr. Courtney's coming downstairs now. Oh, Peter, how is she? I don't know. She's unconscious. She is? Yes. Lucky Dr. Adams happened along. Uh, perhaps I can help. You don't know who she is? We haven't the faintest idea. But wait a minute. Didn't she have a bag, Williams? Uh, yes, sir. A large blue bag. It was lying in the road beside her. I put it in the living room. Well, there might be identification in the bag. I'll look, dear. Oh, wait. Here comes the doctor. The doctor, what do you think? Concussion and Lord knows what else. You know Mrs. Courtney, don't you? Oh, why, yes, sir. How do you do? How do you do? Mrs. Courtney was a nurse during the war. Is that right? Well, I'll uh... be glad to do anything I can, doctor. Anything. Well, that's fine. I'll go back upstairs as soon as I've made some phone calls. As the doctor goes to the telephone, you hurry to the living room, don't you, Barbara? Go straight to the chair where you see a large blue bag. You haven't much time, but you open it quickly. Take out everything that will burn. Toss it all into the flames of the fireplace. You work fast, and a moment later you're glad that you have. Oh, you've just replaced the bag on the chair when Peter enters the room. Well, we've got to find out who she is so her relatives can be notified. Where's the bag? Her, her bag? Oh, yes. This must be it here on the chair. Hmm? Oh, yes. Well, what do you know about that? What's the matter? Well, there's practically nothing in it. Nothing but a compact and a small coin purse. Well, I'd better go tell the doctor. Peter, wait a minute. I, I want to talk to you. Well, of course, dear. What is it? What do you suppose Dr. Adams intends to do? Call an ambulance and take her to a hospital in Palo Alto, I suppose. I wonder if it's safe to move her. What do you mean? Sometimes it isn't in these cases. I'm sure that if Dr. Adams thought he had unlimited funds at his disposal, he'd prefer not to move her and he'd send for an X-ray man and a specialist. Well, if money is any object, I'll take care of everything. Oh, Peter, you're so generous. But it was your idea. Talk to the doctor about it, will you? Of course I will, right away. But first, let me tell you something. Yes? You're one of the sweetest, kindest women in the world. You smile at Peter as he walks away, don't you? He's so unsuspecting and so far from the truth. You breathe easier, realizing that you'll be able to give Myra the money and tell her the letters and all her evidence against you has been destroyed. A little later, as the doctor comes up, it looks as if things are working perfectly in your favor. I've just had a talk with your husband, Mrs. Courtney. Yes, doctor. I must say that you're both being most generous. Naturally, we want to do everything we can. That's very fine of you, very. I called Dr. McLean over in Berkeley. He's an excellent man. He'll be down as soon as he can with an X-ray man. And in the meantime, the patient can remain here? Yes. Now, there isn't much for you to do. Just call me if there's any change. Very well, Doctor. You can trust me. Yeah, I was on my way to an urgent case when this happened. Here. You can reach me at this number for the next hour. Yes, Doctor. Now, the main thing is to let her have quiet. Don't disturb her unless she calls. I understand. If she becomes conscious, she may be in great pain. Give her a hypodermic. And this solution. You know how, of course. Certainly. Good. Nursing experience is a valuable asset. You never know when it's going to come in handy. 
That's so true, Doctor. With a few more instructions, the doctor leaves. You look at the hypodermic and toy with an idea in the back of your mind. It's a way out, isn't it, Barbara? The hypodermic. You know how to use it to settle everything, don't you? But you reject the idea almost as soon as it comes to you. No. Surely you won't have to take such an extreme measure. A few moments later, Peter calls you. Darling, don't you think you'd better get dressed? Dressed? Why, yes, it's getting late. Don't tell me you've forgotten about the party. But surely we can't have the party now. Well, it's too late to do anything else. Don't worry, we can handle this. I've been working like a dog. We've arranged powder and cloak rooms downstairs. The guests won't have to come up to the second floor. Oh, but Peter, the poor woman, the noise. It can't be heard upstairs. And we aren't going to let the guests know that anything is wrong. Peter, I don't see how I can go through with this party. I'm, I'm terribly tired, almost ready to faint. Well, darling, I'm sorry. Why didn't you rest during the day? And that reminds me, William said you were gone all day. Why, yes. To tell you the truth, I drove up to the city. Good Lord, on the day of the party? Why? Well, it was stupid of me, but at the last minute, I I found I didn't have an anniversary present for you. And you went in to get me something. You poor darling. But where is it? Where's what, Peter? The present. I want to see it. Oh, it, it isn't ready yet, Peter. You, you'll see it later. And I'm sure I'll love it. Say, look at the time. I've got to get downstairs. In your confusion, you'd forgotten the party, hadn't you, Barbara? But it doesn't matter now. Myra's found you, but you have everything under control. As long as you're sure, you'll be the first to talk to her when she regains consciousness. Yes, for the present, you feel quite safe. Then you see Williams approaching, accompanied by a tall, gaunt-looking woman. This is Nurse Phillips, Mrs. Coffey. Nurse Phillips? I, I, I don't understand. Uh, Dr. Adams had me sent out from Palo Alto. I came as soon as I could. Will you excuse me, madam? Certainly, William. And uh, where is the patient? Uh, in, in there, nurse. I understand you don't know who she is. Uh, no, we don't. Well, she'll probably come around soon. I'll find out who she is and notify the police. No. Don't do that. But why not? Dr. Adams said to give her a hypodermic. I have a solution. Well, I'm in charge now, Mrs. Courtney. And I know Dr. Adams' instructions. Now, you run along and get ready for your party. Oh, uh, you will bring me the hypodermic and solution Dr. Adams left with you? Oh, yes. Yes, nurse. I'll, I'll bring it to you. Right away. Even as you realize the helplessness of your position with the arrival of Nurse Phillips, you begin to plan again, don't you, Barbara? It won't do to let anyone else be at Myra's side when she comes to, will it? And you're determined that there's only one way now to stop her. The answer is simple, isn't it? Just a few drops of the deadly poison the gardener uses on your roses. You slip away from Peter and the party guests long enough to add the deadly dosage to the solution given you by Dr. Adams. A few moments later, you're back upstairs. Yes? Oh, Mrs. Courtney. Uh, here's the hypodermic, nurse. And the solution, fine. Uh, I'm glad you're here to administer. You know, it's been so long for me, I'm afraid I've forgotten all about this sort of thing. <laughs> well, I'll take care of it. Dr. Adams said, right away. He seemed quite insistent. <laughs> I said I'll take care of it, Mrs. Courtney, right away. Now, please, go back to your guests. After all, it is your anniversary. You should be enjoying the party with your husband. Yes, I should. <laughs> you know, Nurse, it's so reassuring having you take over. I do believe I can enjoy the party now. Yes, Barbara, you go downstairs, join the guests and your husband. You're safe now, aren't you? Much later, Peter manages to get you alone for a moment. Darling, I broke away for a minute just to tell you, well, that you're a great success. A completely charming hostess. I'm so glad you think so, Peter. And under such trying conditions. Uh, yes. Excuse me, madam, sir. Uh, yes, William? Uh, Dr. Adams is here. Oh? He's out in the foyer. Let's go, dear. Uh, please don't be upset, madam, but uh, I have the feeling that everything isn't as it should be. 
I see. Hello, Dr. Adams. Mrs. Courtney, I'm I'm sorry. Well, has anything happened, Dr. Adams? Unfortunately, yes. You don't mean... Yes. Uh, Mrs. Courtney, the, the patient is dead. Oh, I'm so sorry. She died before Dr. McLean and I got here. How tragic. Yes, isn't it? However, I was sure from the first that she didn't have a chance. She... She didn't? No. Dr. McLean agrees with me. Now, you go back to your party. We're going to take care of everything very quietly. Your guests won't know that anything's happened. Come along, dear. You did all that you could. Yes. Yes, Peter, I did all I could. There's nothing left to do now. in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Barbara, you're certain that you're in the clear now, aren't you? You're sure that Myra... The one person who could identify you with the killing of the racketeer Victor Tremonti years ago is eliminated, dead. Now you can continue fooling the police as you have for years as Mrs. Peter Corton. It seems strange, doesn't it, to have Myra struck down by a car near your home. And you managed to dispose of the contents of her bag in the fireplace before anyone could see them. But it's over now, and also the very successful party. And the next morning at breakfast, Peter greets you with the newspaper. You smile, realizing that you're no longer afraid of newspapers and photographers. Good morning, darling. Did you rest well? Oh, I was tired. Well, you had a right to be. What a party. I told Williams not to let any calls disturb you. You had quite a few. Phone's been ringing constantly. Ooh. <laughs> Am I a big success, darling? Are you? <laughs> it makes quite a story on the society page. Huh? Listen, I'll read it to you. Entertaining 200 guests is no easy job under the best circumstances. But few hostesses have been confronted with the situation Barbara Courtney found herself in last night. With a gay party going on downstairs, she had the added responsibility of an uninvited guest in an upper bedroom, a victim of a hit-and-run accident near the Courtney estate. But Mrs. Courtney, a former nurse, was equal to the occasion. She did everything in her power to try to save the life of the fatally injured woman. I only did what anyone would have done. Oh, no, dear. You were most thoughtful. Mr. Courtney, the police are here. The Lieutenant Briscoe. The police? Oh, about the hit-and-run accident yesterday. Oh, not entirely, Mr. Courtney. Huh? Sorry to intrude on you like this, but uh, we're here to make an arrest. Arrest? Yes. Your wife. What are you talking about? We've been looking for your wife ever since the killing of a man named Tremonti six years ago. Myra Dorsey told us all about your part in that killing, Mrs. Courtney. She also showed us some very incriminating photographs of you. But Myra never regained consciousness. Myra Dorsey wasn't unconscious. She's in jail on a hit-and-run charge. She got talkative because she thought you saw the accident and turned her in. Actually, we traced the license number. You mean Myra was the driver? That's right. A rented car. Myra Dorsey was the one that hit the unfortunate woman who died. The woman who was identified at the coroner's office as... Mary Benson of Burlingame. Mary Benson? Mary Benson? Oh, that was the name of the young woman who failed to arrive to serve at the party. Please, Barbara, tell me. This is all some sort of a, a joke, isn't it? No. I'm afraid it is, Peter. A horrible joke. One that I played on myself. Let that whistle be your signal for The Whistler each Sunday night at this same time. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as The Whistler, Byron Kane, Alice Reinhardt, Joe Gilbert, Herbert Butterfield, Herbert Litton, and Bill Boucher. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by George Adrian and Carol Nix. Music by Wilbur Hatch. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when this will bring you another strange story by The Whistler entitled A Case for Mr. Carrington.
in which the heat and native passions of tropical Jamaica combine to bring a young American to the point of killing and final payment for his crime. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thank you.